To some of you, this may sound like a weird statement, but hills aren't free. A common fallacy among some EV drivers is that hill climbing doesn't matter because you regenerate as much power going downhill as it took you to get uphill. This video is about why that's not true, and then we're gonna test it out in this Polestar 2 long range. The first thing we're gonna do is drive this over a mountain pass. It's 21 miles. We'll go from 300 feet elevation up to 2,000 feet and then back down to 300 feet to see exactly how much energy it takes to accomplish that 21 miles. Then we're gonna take that same average speed and drive it on a level course to see exactly what the consumption per mile is on that level course versus the average for that hill climb. Now, one of the reasons I have chosen the Polestar 2 is that it has pretty aggressive regenerative braking and it has blended braking. So if I start putting my foot on the brake pedal on the downhill of this mountain climb, it's still gonna be stuffing power back into the battery. Let's just get right to the numbers. Right now I'm in Los Gatos, California. We're at about 300 feet of elevation above sea level. We're gonna go up to approximately 2,000 feet above sea level on this mountain highway. This is the one that I commute on every day, which is why I have always been a little bit perplexed about this myth and why it seems to persist. Here's the basis of the fallacy. It is going up the hill, going down the hill, you have regenerative braking, so therefore it's gonna be exactly the same as driving on level ground. But people forget that regenerative braking is A, not as efficient as people think. It's not a 100% cycle. You cannot get all the energy back from stopping from 60 miles an hour that it took to get you up to 60 miles an hour in the first place. Regenerative braking is a fantastic thing and it definitely improves the range and efficiency of electric vehicles, hybrids, plug-in hybrids, etc. but it's not a magic wand. We still have to get 4,000 pounds of EV up a hill and then downhill. And there's still other factors like wind resistance and all of that involved. Hopefully you all enjoy this round trip with me. We're gonna do the 21 mile round trip. I'm gonna take a look at my average speed, etc. We're then gonna try and find a level piece of open highway where we can have that exact same speed as level as possible. Then we're gonna do a little bit of math. Then of course we're gonna DC fast charge the Polestar, but you won't find that DC fast charging in this video. You'll find that in the full video of the Polestar single motor. So be sure and check that out. After we filmed the introduction of this video, we posted about it. Some folks were a little bit concerned that we were going up one side of the mountain and down the other. That's why it was a 21 mile route. Instead, we are now going up and down the same side because they said, hang on, that's not fair. The route might be a little bit different. Here, it's gonna be approximately the same profile, same number of miles, of course, from up and down, essentially. And we're gonna try and keep the speed as consistent as possible. The other thing some of you asked was for us to use one pedal driving. So I am definitely doing that, and there's a reason. Because if I have the one pedal driving mode enabled in this vehicle, it's set to low, not high, mind you, then it's pretty sure that it's not gonna be using much friction braking at all on this downhill slope. And I'm being very cautious to not use the actual brake pedal. Although, in the Polestar 2, we have blended braking. So if I put my foot on the brake pedal, I am actually getting regenerative braking into the battery until it can no longer regenerate enough power. So it actually needs more stopping power, I guess you'd say, then it's gonna engage the friction brakes. So this is trying to be as fair as possible, you should get very similar results in just about any EV out there with an aggressive regeneration capability. We've descended a reasonable portion of this mountain pass already, and the fuel efficiency numbers are definitely improving. By the time we made it to the top, the average was around 1.8, 1.9 miles per kilowatt hour. It definitely takes a lot of energy to get a 4,000 pound EV up the hill. I'm gonna go ahead and move over a little bit, something that I wouldn't normally do, but of course, again, we're trying to keep the speeds as consistent as possible for repeatable results here. Uh, I, for people that always complain about this, I would remind you that uh, passing on the right is actually not illegal in California. It's totally fine in this state. So uh, if it's illegal where you are, then don't do it. Uh, here in California, that particular mover maneuver was just fine. At any rate, back to the fuel efficiency numbers. Earlier today, we did some round trip routes at 65, 55 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour, and 70 miles an hour in this exact vehicle to try and get an idea of how the relative efficiency compared. At 55 to 60 miles an hour, this averaged 4.3 miles per kilowatt hour. So that's actually better than the EPA numbers would indicate. According to the EPA, this should be actually right around 3.8 miles per kilowatt hour on the highway. 3.9 miles per kilowatt hour gets you to the combined fuel efficiency score of 320 miles for this vehicle. So it was actually punching a little bit above its weight. 
there we are. We have now reached the exact same point that we entered this highway. Our average speed here was 58 miles an hour. This average, 3.3 miles per kilowatt hour. It's worth noting that's not a bad score. It definitely is better than you might think, certainly better than just climbing up the hill, but that is decently below our other tests earlier today. In fact, over the last 131 miles, this vehicle has been averaging 3.9 miles per kilowatt hour. So significantly better, even though that average speed is actually 65 miles an hour because we were doing a lot of highway testing loops earlier in the day. All right, I'm now getting on State Highway 85 where we are going to be prepared to be going very slow and annoying traffic all around us because I am going to set the cruise control here to uh, 58 miles an hour and then we'll see what happens. Go ahead and reset the trip computer. Again, I checked on the uh, Google Maps as far as the map profile and elevation profile. This portion of 85 is very, very level. It fluctuates only maybe about 20 feet in elevation uh, over the next 10 miles or so. So this is a pretty decent place to be running this particular test here. And uh, I have also set the cruise control to regular cruise control, not adaptive cruise control. So. Hopefully that's going to give us the most consistent speed. So uh, let's just uh, see how we go. Yep, things are already not looking good for the hill climb being free. Uh, we're only two miles in, but uh, you know I won't spoil it for you. Let's see how it goes. To make things as fair as possible, I've now turned on Interstate 280, which is also relatively flat in this area. And I can tell you now that things are definitely looking much better efficiency-wise here. We are decently over four miles per kilowatt hour. Remember that aerodynamics has a big impact on efficiency. So this may be getting 3.5, 3.7 miles per kilowatt hour at 70 miles an hour, but down here below 60 miles an hour, it is significantly more efficient. I just passed the 13 mile mark and the numbers are pretty clear. We have now managed to average 5.2 miles per kilowatt hour out here on the open highway, just going a steady 58 miles an hour. That is significantly more fuel efficient than going up and down that hill. Yes, regenerative braking will certainly get you to a better place, but it's also gonna be consuming 50% more energy to climb up and down that hill. And that is a big, big difference. Had this EV not had regenerative braking, clearly the difference would be even more. Now, I realize that there is a little bit of extra consumption involved in the windy nature of that road, the fact that there's some energy consumed by the steering column, by some extra friction going around those corners, etc. But that does not account for the 50% increase in consumption on the exact same speeds, simply going up and down the hill. It's the fact that you had to take 4,000 pounds up a hill, which causes that difference. So for that and other information, be sure and find us over at facebook.com slash the auto buyers guide. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, all the other social places. And of course, stay tuned for more videos like this coming up on EV buyers guide and all the full content over on auto buyers guide as well. I'll see all of you later.